unable to chime in. Good morning, good afternoon, and good day. Welcome to the Global Chamber of Commerce for our very special Globinar, which, which showcases Michael Quigley. And this is a very special event focused on launching Michael's new book, Loving Leadership. Just to start, I'd like to introduce myself for those who don't know me. My name is Katie Keith, and I'm the Executive Director for the Global Chamber here in London. And I'm joined by Hannah Lord, who is our Deputy Director for the Global Chamber in London. Welcome, Hannah, if you'd like to give us a wave. Yeah, hi everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, excited to meet you, Michael. I know we've not met yet, but looking forward to, um, yeah, to loving leadership and loving this webinar. It's going to be a very emotional one, I think. And this is a really good opportunity for all of us who invested, who have invested the next hour, turn off WhatsApp, turn off the email, really take this time to invest in yourself and each other as we work through this, this wonderful hour ahead. So I just wanted to say good afternoon to Michael Quigley, who has been a really special part of our global community for over two years now. And I've been working with Michael uh, very closely to support him in all of his initiatives. We have his podcast each week that we share on our online platform. Michael is a book author and we've read the first two books, but this latest book, Loving Leadership, really hit a chord with me. And I think it's just been one of the most amazing pocket rocket books that I've read in a long time. And I've still been using it. And I look forward to doing a bit of a testimonial. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce Michael more formally and hand over to him because he's going to be sharing some amazing insights from the book today. So it is a rare opportunity to sit with Michael for the next hour to explore the launch of his book, Loving Leadership. He'll be taking us through the Loving Leadership model and framework and also share extra stories about what brought him to writing the book and also you'll hear some lovely testimonials for those that the book has touched. For those who don't know Michael yet, he's worked for over 10 years both in the public sector as a teacher and the private sector as a business owner. He's an author, trainer and keynote speaker and actually he's one of the best keynote speakers I've actually seen in a very long time. So if you need to book him for something, let me know. Michael is passionate about helping you to achieve your potential as a leader. Michael is the person who is there for you. He's got your back. He gives you the encouragement, the tools, the opportunities, and the belief to empower yourself as a leader. Michael, over to you. Okay, I've never said this before on camera, but I'm going to try not to cry because this right now is like a dream come true. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so this is how this is going to work. This is not a training session. This is not a keynote speech. Andy is a friend of mine. This is not a speech, Andy, don't break. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit about um, why I wrote the book because it's really important to me that and that you know the background behind that. But we're going to hear from Katie and we're going to hopefully hear from Eowyn. And back to Katie a second time is going to be speaking on behalf of somebody else. Eowyn, nice to see you. Um, and it, I think it's important that you understand we're not trying to sell you a book here. <laughs> it's not what it's about. It's about understanding this book has been out for a few months in the world and done some good, but we're just getting started. Um, I'm going to take you a little bit through some self-reflective questions. So if you've got a pen and a paper, if you're the kind of person who likes to reflect and learn, you're welcome to do so. If you think, now I just want to sit and listen, you're welcome to do so. If you want to share some of your answers in the chat box and get a bit kind of interactive, you're welcome to do so. But I always say there's no pressure at all. Um, so let's just begin. So one thing, if you could keep yourself on mute, please. It's not because I don't want to hear from you. I definitely want to hear from you. It's just for background noise. Uh, the, the best I ever heard was a seagull once, which was hilarious. And this woman was saying to me, can you get this woman to mute herself? Because that seagull's putting me off my learning. Okay, so if you, if you like writing quotes, here's a doozy for you. Only love has the depth to handle the complexities and challenges of the human condition. Only love has the depth to handle the complexities and the challenges of the human condition. I believe that so much. That's one of mine. It's not even in the book. But that's what I'm drawing from, and that's why I wrote this book. So I wrote this book because I believe that leaders, um, they need support. They need inspiration. And they also need practical stuff. I'm going to give you two quick definitions of leadership that I use. One from a good friend of ours, Doug Brunke from the Global Chamber, and one from another guy. So leadership to me is not fluffy. It's a way of life. And I take it that seriously. If you know me, I don't take myself seriously. So but I take this very seriously. So leaders are, quote, if you are responsible for improving the future, you are a leader. That's a guy called Anthony Inarino. I recommend him. He's a sales trainer, uh, American guy. Very challenging stuff. Not easy stuff. And I thought, wow, that's really accessible. If I'm trying to improve the future, I'm a leader. And I only read that after I've written the book. But if you're a parent, if you work in a charity, if you run your own business, 
you're supporting somebody in business, you're trying to be a good person, improve somebody's life, including your own, that is a form of leadership. And then the second thing I want to give you, which is brilliant, I got it from Doug Brunke when I attended a webinar last year from the Global Chamber. All these different leaders, well more experienced than me. They said, what is leadership? And Doug said, it's holding nothing in your mind so you can respond to the needs of your people in real time. I love that. It's not going in with these kind of preconceived things. I'm going to use this technique on this person. No, it's saying, can I be present in this moment and give what is needed to my people, right? So I love that because I think, well, where's that coming from? And to me, it sounds really simple, but isn't the greatest resource we have in our lives, the love we have in our heart, usually for our family? Is that not the strongest thing that has endured for thousands of years? And yet we don't talk about it a lot. Everybody says, I love my family but I run a business. I'm like, take the butt out. I love my family and I run a business, right? So that, I just wanted to start with that because I think it's really, really important. So this book, there it is. My brother did the artwork for it. He's amazing. Um, it's a cognitive, a moral, and ethical framework for leadership. What the heck does that mean? What it means is cognitive is the way you think. Morals is what's important to you. And ethics are things that benefit people, hopefully, a lot of people. Leaders don't need to tell them what to do. They have to play by different rules but they do need guidance. So if you are in a leadership position or if you are supporting someone in a leadership position, understand that it's lonely, it's difficult, it's stressful, and you are held accountable. Like I said before, if you're not accountable for improving the future, you're not a leader. Don't get me started about influencers. Don't get me started, right? But people need this kind of help and support. And that's what I do. I'm like the how guy. When I do something, I'll come to me and I'll show you some ways of doing it, right? But more than that, I love people. I genuinely believe that our global family, as we call it, of 8 billion people, I love you all. And to me, that's where leadership and love, they just go together. I don't get this, this disconnect. I really don't get it. So that's why I wrote it. Um, and I want, you to, I want you to listen to another quote, which really means a lot to me. And then we're going to go to Katie. So I'll give you a quick heads up, Katie, in about a minute. And hear, what, you know, hear what Katie thinks of it. Um, it's from a guy called Thomas Merton, who was a Christian mystic, incredible guy. And he said, you are made in the image of what you desire. And just like that, thinking, you're made in the image of what you desire. If you desire love, your life, who you are as a beautiful soul, will be made in that image and it'll be gorgeous. Anybody who knows my background story knows I was a primary school teacher. What am I doing running a business and writing books, right? But the image of what I desire is to help people and to love people and be kind to people, et cetera, et cetera. It's led me to the Global Chamber. It's led me to you here today. And I take great pride in that. Yeah. If you think about the image of what, what do you desire? Because you're making yourself in that image. And that's good. But it also, you can see how it also holds you to account. Uh, I say I'm all about this, but I'm actually doing this. And I think that's good. We should hold ourselves to account. So that's kind of just a little kind of background as to, you know, why I wrote it. So Katie um, is going to say a couple of things that she enjoyed. And this is what's really exciting for me, because the whole point of this book is to help people. And to hear it's already started helping people means a lot to me. So Katie, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And, um, and, and welcome to those who have just joined us whilst Michael was um, kicking off today's book launch session. Actually, Michael, I just want to say congratulations. As a book author, this is honestly a, an amazing achievement of yourself, which when reading the book on the train and just trying to go back and rereading a page and going, how does that, what does that mean for me? You know, really reflecting on that. Um, so really it did touch a chord. And as I keep saying to everyone, it's a little pocket rocket. And I say that because it can almost fit in my pocket, but it certainly fits in my backpack. And it's something which I have uh, bunny eared a lot. And today I just wanted to share um, a little bit about myself as a leader as well. Like I actually lead in various different ways and I worked in banking for 20 years and I was leading teams, direct reports. And it took me moving all the way from Sydney to London to realize leadership is more than just managing people. Leadership is more than just looking after a team or, you know, it is about looking after communities. It's about influencing change. It's about how you take yourself forward, how you are. It's a, it's a way of being almost. And so reading Loving Leadership really brought that to life and helped me to reconnect with what leadership actually meant for me. Um, 
you know, I've got a small team here in finance that I look after. I've got the global chamber community, this amazing tribe that I'm connected into and look after. And then I've also got my clients and my affiliates that I look after. And so one thing that when things aren't going so well and I have to reconnect into what that might mean, how do I lead there? How do I lead here and lead here all at the, at the same time? And it was the cat in the box. And so I'm I'm going to share it with you. So it's actually on page 70 and 71 in the book. And I don't know if you guys have the book, but the cat in the box is a well-known thinking exercise. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole page because we'll be here all day, but it takes you through like a bit of rationale around, you know, how important is it and how can you rationalize it and put it into context? So that's just sort of my relay on what that means. But some of the questions would be, so take an example of a problem that you're currently facing and write it down and really just look at it and, and think about one, what is terrible about, what is terrible about it or could be question. Number two, what is it great about it? or could be, question. See them as both possible, hold them both in the super, super position and pay attention to any insights that you may have. Number four, now see how you would want it to be. And this is about visualizing and this is where it starts to change. And then number five is make a plan and take action. Five easy steps for me to write down what my problem is, what is my challenge, why am I not achieving what I need to achieve right now with my team, with my community, and actually putting it in, why is it terrible? Why is it good? What do I want from it? And what am I going to do about it? So Michael, just the practicality of that, the easiness of reading it, and and just the way it helped me to move forward in my leadership role was just brilliant. Uh, so page 70, 71, the cat in the box, I just love the name of that, was my favourite part. So thank you, Michael. I'll hand back over to you now. Thank you very much. It's, it means a lot. I'll show you something you've never seen before. Check this out. This is the original piece of artwork that my brother did. And I saw it and I thought, oh, love that. Absolutely love that. So like Katie was saying, you've got to think. Ugh. And if you, writers write, I've said this before, if you write, you're a writer. You want to have a book, write it. I'm just a writer. I'm not special. And I think that's what's really important to keep in mind for, for leadership. It's not a form of hurting yourself and it's not a form of being arrogant. It's a form of service. If you're interested in the backstory to it, I was very influenced by Servant Leadership by Robert Greenleaf, uh, the work of Louise Hay, all sorts of different people. So you want to know background, just I can tell you that another time. In the chat box, please just write one thing or one person that you love. I'd love to know. If we're saying this thing before about you made in the image of what you desire, it's like, are you desiring to help your family? Are you trying to impact the world, a certain cause? Are you trying to improve yourself? Have you got certain areas that you just think, oh, I love that. I absolutely love that. Because I learned that from Viktor Frankl, which I'll, I'll come into now and talk a little bit about the book. Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor. And he realized that traditional psychotherapy didn't work because he wasn't the cause of his problems. <laughs> when his family died, he said, how do you build a life around what you love? And go forward with that. And I thought, oh, that's powerful stuff, you know. And um, I have to say, massive hi to S Sandy, by the way, my good friend Sandy. She said she's excited for me. I'm excited, Sandy. Right. I'm trying to not get too carried away because this is this is very special, guys. All right. So we're going to move on into. I'm going to take you through a little bit of the six kind of parts to the book and take you through some self-reflective questions because, like Katie said, it's very practical. You don't need to have read the book to have to gain some stuff from it today that can hopefully help you in your leadership. Okay. So there are six beliefs. If you think of a framework, framework needs different parts. It's not just a bunch of random stuff. It has a cohesive narrative to it. And I'm very proud of it. I think it's the best thing I've ever written. I've been writing a long time. But just while I'm saying this, maybe have a look at what everybody's saying about what or whom they love. It might not be what you think. It's an interesting one. Anybody knows me, he knows my dog is my son. <laughs> right? I love that dog. Don't get me started on my dog. Okay. I also got a really good piece of feedback from somebody who shall remain nameless, who read it and said, it's not an easy read. And I said, yeah, I know. And he went, no. I think he thought it was going to be just like, you know, there you go. It is in a nutshell. Here's the secret. Well, there's no secret. <laughs> Love is hard, man. And once we talked about it, it was okay. So the first chapter is called There Is No Enemy. There Is No Enemy. That was inspired by, but just before I had a business and I went to Auschwitz and I 
remember that when I came back from the trip, I went to a hotel and was eating these dumplings. And I started crying. I can still remember it. Because I was thinking, why am I here and they're not? Right? Not being political or anything like that. I was like, why am I here and they're not? And it brought it alive to me that that, that I thought was something that happened to some random people I don't know in history it was a collective thing. It was like a shared human thing. It was really bad that happened to us. And now I know that I was beginning of what me and Katie would call like my global mindset. It hit home between the eyes. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is something that happened to my family here. And I really reflected on that. And that actually inspired me to start my business because I saw how bad things would get. I wanted to make it better. But we have this idea, don't we, that we have enemies. We have competition in business. We don't talk to those kind of people. They're not like us. I put forward the radical notion that you can let that go. Right? Just think what that would do for you. If you could let the concept, even the concept itself of having an enemy, just let it go. Just from now on, I think, what would that look like? It doesn't mean we're super best friends with everybody. But we don't put ourselves in a position to somebody and say, that is my enemy, right? So in terms of a self-reflective question, if you want to write it down, you don't have to. But, you know, who's been a perceived enemy of yours in the past? Is it somebody from a different religion? Somebody from a different football team? You know, somebody you're in opposition with? And could you let that go? Could you seriously, right now, could you be willing to let to start to let that go? So that was, you know, so get straight into it right from the start. You know, if you, if you let that go. And the second chapter then goes on to embrace what we call lifelong learning. And it's that responsibility of growing and developing yourself. A leader's, leader's job is never done. It's always happening. Love is always unfolding, you know. The love that creates the universe in whatever form that means to you is not finished. I remember going to Portugal, slightly off topic, and swimming in the sea and looking at the honeycomb structures of all the cliffs and the sparkling of the water and thinking, millions of years, whenever I came from this sea and now I've evolved <laughs> to go on the land and then come back to this sea and reflect on this. And I get to be here for a week and just look at this gorgeous thing. Oh my goodness. And the, and the universe unfolding as we now know it is evolution really hit me that and that's why i love thomas merton the guy i said about you made the image of what you desire he also said we're all shimmering all the time in this beautiful light we just don't see it but when we focus on being loving we do see it you ever had that with somebody and you're talking to them and you're like how oh, i never noticed you're just amazing what we call the golden butter underneath the clay we're all golden so the second thing is talking about growing and developing and embracing that lifelong learning anybody knows me knows i love to learn but that can bring a challenge because we don't we get imposter syndrome. Who am I to write a book? Who am I to run a business? Who am I to be a mother? Who am I to set myself up in believing this cause? Well, somebody's going to do it. And I'm pretty sure for the best roles in your life, you never get a certificate. <laughs> and even once you do, you still doubt yourself because you know the next level. I never got a PhD, right? It doesn't haunt me. I don't care. But you see what I'm trying to say? Yeah, we grow and develop, but we grow and develop our people. Anybody who has what they call a fixed mindset, I've arrived. You've capped yourself. We're not done yet. We're not done. So growing and developing is, is chapter two. Uh, and there's a self-reflection on that. Here's a nice one. If you're writing this stuff down, who's inspired your growth and development? Who's inspired? I'm going to come to it at the end, but I thought I'd share a picture with you that I've never really shared with many people before. And this man was somebody I'm going to mention right at the end. And I have a picture of him behind my laptop every single day every single day i look at that picture i'm not gonna cry <laughs> and he's inspired my growth and development i'm not special guys i'm really not we're all special that's a fundamental belief of mine anybody who knows me understands that i am not sat here going look at me i'm saying look at us look at you look at what what we've been able to do and come together you're never going to be together in this format ever again that's why you should connect with each other on linkedin Whereas the Spanish call it LinkedIn, as my Spanish teacher called, told me, which is so cute. All right, let's move on. And then we're going to come to Eowyn. So Eowyn, maybe about five minutes, if you're happy to give her a minute or two. That'd be much appreciated. Thank you very much. She's dedicated. She's not even finished work, and she's gone and found a, a room and hired it so she can be here. The third one is what Katie was talking about for. It's called Embracing Paradox. And this is quite brutal. But if we love people and they die, it sucks. Does it not? We love people and they get ill. It sucks. It is the price we pay for love. 
And when people don't quite understand what I mean by that, I say, well, do you have any kids? They go, yeah. Do you love them? Oh, to the end of the world. What would happen if anything bad happened to them? I'll be the worst day of my life. So can you see, and I've experienced this person in my family, when you love somebody, it can hurt you, but then you love them. So it's like what they call the cat in the box. It's both the best and the worst thing. And we've got to be okay with that. And that's why I come back to the first quote. It said, our leadership, our love, it has to have depth. It can't just work when everything's okay. That's not leadership. Yeah, that's, that's just, I don't know, preferences. So only love has the depth. Where do you draw from, right? Do you draw from your money? No, that always runs out. Do you draw from your values? Well, that's better because that's your character. But if you draw from the depths, the love, right? I don't know a single generation that's grown up in the past 200 years that goes, we're just not going to do love. Generation, whatever comes after Gen Z, right? We're just, we're just that's an old fashioned thing. We're done with love. It's, it's, it's eternal. We all know what it is. And yet you go, you can't go buy it. You can't even see it. You can feel it, right? So that paradox, if you are sat there going, some of the best things that happen to me are some of the worst things that happen to me. Well done. You're ahead of most people. And you're able to conceptualize paradox is the nature of reality, right? Life only works because we die. Get your head around that. Here's a practical example for me was COVID. I had people that I know die. But then my business grew by 500%. If I don't have depth in my leadership, I can't comprehend that. I think it's either a good or bad thing. Well, I think we all understand now, don't we? It's not as simple as that. Business isn't as simple as that. Family is not as simple as that. People aren't good or bad people. They do good and bad things. We can morally characterize. But people are complicated and hilarious and brilliant and wonderful, bizarre. And if we're comfortable, as Robert Greenlee said, comfortable with complexity, then it's fine. If we go around looking for simple solutions and secrets and answers, especially in relation to people, we're going to be perpetually disappointed. So embrace that paradox. Yeah? Be okay with going, I bet there's some things right now you're going, I ain't got a flying clue about the answer to this thing. That's okay. I've got loads of problems I haven't solved yet. That's okay. Embrace that paradox. It's going to help me grow somehow. So let's move on to a couple more. So in terms of that, um, we're thinking in terms of paradox, the, the self-reflection question is basically just think of, have you ever had somebody you thought was really a good person? And they did something awful. And you're saying, oh, you let me down. I thought you were so amazing. Or you've got that person saying, he's a nightmare. And then he does something really nice. You think, well, what's he after? Maybe they're just being authentic. Maybe it's it's our conception the person needs to deepen. Right? So that's in terms of paradox. The fourth one, I, th I think I take a little break now because I want to come to Eowyn. The fourth one, we talk a little bit about relationships. So Eowyn is a friend of Katie's and mine. And I am so like proud of Eowyn because she persevered with the book which I know was a challenge and you're working full-time you're leading this team and she sent me a message a picture when she'd finished it I was like I'm so proud of you you know because reading is difficult isn't it you don't get a certificate for it you can't do it in 10 seconds so Eowyn I just want to take the chance publicly to say thank you because I know you persevered with that because it meant a lot to you um, and hopefully you enjoyed it so Eowyn if you want to describe a little bit about yourself and what you do and, and how you like the book yeah, thank you, Michael. Okay, a little bit about me. I'm from a construction background. I now work in science and I manage three functions in our laboratory. We test hair, blood samples and DNA. So there is a lot going on. Uh, I really enjoy the book. And for those who don't know me, I find reading really challenging. I've got the attention span of a flea. I use the read aloud function on documents all the time so my computer can read to me. Um, but I did carry this book around with me, Michael, and I did really enjoy it. Um, one of the reasons I enjoyed it is it was compartmentalized into different sections. And I found it really easy to, to go with. The bit that resonated with me was the embracing paradox and the good and, well, at least the good perceived and the bad perceived in people. I was blindsided by a couple of leadership challenges earlier on this year and I felt completely lost. You are often quite alone as a leader and like a lot of people, I 
found myself in management you don't get a course and then you're ready and you pass and you go into it you get dropped in it and you sink or swim so having a tool at my disposal to help me navigate my way through leading has been indispensable um, it's made me also think a little bit more emotionally aware of not just myself but how others react to things as well so rather than my instant reaction to very difficult interactions with people being oh my god they're being unreasonable what's wrong with people I've challenged myself to think why and I've actually started engaging them letting them have a few minutes to, to let it all out and then say right well why have you got this response what's driving this and, and showing them a little bit of love and kindness I think there's a misconception in leadership where you you think or at least you're led to think that you should be telling people what to do all the time actually our, our role is to encourage people to work through things themselves and bring out the very best in others by helping them to draw that out of themselves not standing there like a regiment or sergeant major barking orders which ironically in construction still takes place um i like to talk a lot as well but in a nutshell this, this has really really helped me thank you and i did persevere with it and thank you for checking in on me making me accountable as well <laughs> you're welcome thank you very much Emma. that's brilliant and you I'll, I'll tell you now because I don't tell people that you don't know how much this means to me to know that you can create something that does good in the world. Me and Andy were talking about this. All, all my good friend Andy here wants to do is, is help make the world a better place. Well, isn't it business and charity and, and parenthood and all these things where we can actually tangibly do that and hold ourselves accountable for improving the future back to that definition? That is leadership, guys. Like I was saying, title doesn't mean anything. It gives you no moral authority whatsoever. Yeah, I'm not going to talk politics. So the fourth chapter is all about relationships being sacred. And I chose the word sacred on purpose. For some people, it has religious connotations. For other people, it doesn't. One of the best definitions I heard of the word sacred is it means vital to life. If something is sacred to you, it's beyond being important and a veneration of praise. It is vital to your life, right? We've all seen in terms of COVID what that actually means, haven't we? Yeah. When your relation, I spent 12 weeks in my house on my own. That's called solitary confinement, guys. That's not cool. So relationships are essential to life. Absolutely essential. And yet we don't get trained in these kind of things. So I've got a, a self-focusing question for um, number four. So just think of one of the best relationships in your life. Just take a minute to think about it. It could be a partner. It could be a friend. It could be an animal. Right? What is it that makes it so special? Why is it? Is it they affirm you? They love you? They accept you? I challenge you why is it why is that relationship so good yeah it's a very it's a very simple thing to say but we tend to go oh this person but why what would they say about you right? so the fifth chapter is something that is where maybe i'm a little bit different to most people but i don't mind it's called thinking long term and anybody knows me knows i'm in this for long term right I'm talking decades, if not generations. And that changes your perspective. If you are thinking love in the short term, okay. But if you're thinking in terms of three generations and 100 years, you're going to make some different decisions, different choices, like I was saying before. Are you going to shout at a member of staff? Are you going to understand that mum has cancer and they've had four hours sleep? And you know that. And you can kind of say, oh, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Because it's not about you, but if you ever lose it with people, you've lost them inside. I remember from teaching. You know, those children, are so, they look up to you, the whole world. And it's not the subjects you teach them. It's like they're basically going, does he actually care about me? Spoiler alert, ad adults are exactly the same. Exactly the same. Do they do you actually care about them? Yeah. And, and once you do, oh, it's amazing. When you don't, you could talk to people in the face or lead them as much as you want and they won't care because you have no what's called moral authority. But if you do, it's very powerful. So in terms of thinking long term, here's a self-reflective question for you. What does long-term actually mean to you? Does it mean next year, five years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years? Yeah. What does long-term actually mean to you? Because if you think about things in short-term or long-term, you make different decisions and different choices. I did a video about it last week. 
high performance in short term, high performance long term. It's not the same thing. You need to rest. You need to recover. Yeah, and if you're a parent, you know you know all about that. Not now. Mummy's tired. Right? You got to play the long game. When I used to teach five year olds, you say, "Oh, do you like kids?" I'm like, "Not really. <laughs> I like people." And they're five now, but in 13 years they'll be 18, and they'll remember what I said. And a lot of them are now in their early 20s, which is scary and crazy. But it's the same thing, right? If you're talking to people, you're building relationships with them over a period of time. You don't know how good that is. And I've got another quote from the book, and I can't believe I'm quoting myself on camera, but I'm going to do it because it's from a book, right? Not from me. There's no limit to how good a relationship can be. Please write that down or just let that sing. There's no limit. We put the limits on it. There's no limit to how good a relationship can be. You open the door, you start investing in each other, and you take it for as long as you want. You ride it as long as you can. But the limits come from the point where we go, I've had enough. And I don't know many people that have had enough of being loved, right? But we do put limits on it. I'm not interested in those. I'm really not. I'm more interested in how far can we take it. So far, it seems to be working, right? But thinking long-term, for you and your leadership, helps you to calm down, helps you to bring this, this, you know, this gentle presence. We all know those people that float in the room and like, she's like a swan, look at her go. She just makes you feel really calm. I just want to be around her. And we all know people when they just say, oh, there they go. And it's often they're just like, ah, you know? When we think in long-term, everything changes. It does. And then the final chapter is very powerful one, which is why it's last, right? And it's called Meaning Matters. And I've, I've written this in the book, and this is this is something that just, if you just remember one thing, please remember this. Many, many people right now are lonely. They're isolated. And they feel that... <laughs> they feel that who they are doesn't matter. <laughs> and it does. And as a leader, you can help them to discover just how amazing they are. You don't need to compliment them. You don't need to tell them your answers. You just, by helping them, can help. There is no greater achievement in life than helping somebody to believe in themselves. Right? Because you can light that fire inside. They can take it and run with it, and that could last 50 years. I'm getting shivers thinking about it. Because I know people have done that for me, and I know you'll know people have done that for you. And so many people right now, in this weird paradox where they're like, nothing matters, but everything's recorded. <laughs> and I don't, and nothing, and I'm, I'm not a good person, or I'm not. And, it, and they downplay themselves. And they think that who they are doesn't matter. And it does so much. And if you can help somebody to understand that they have intrinsic value just because they're a human being and they're an example of life evolving over a billion years and looking at themselves going, oh, I guess I'm a bit rubbish. No. Stardust, gold dust, absolutely amazing. And we, when you say that to people with conviction and genuine feeling, not because you're after something, they just, they drop their barriers and they'll say things like, really? You're the first person who's told me that a long time. You know? And that's where the ethical side comes in. You know, we can't mess with people. That's why I've called it loving leadership, not liking leadership. Love has depth, yeah? What we like and our preferences are change overnight. But if you love somebody, you do the right thing by them, especially when you make mistakes, right? And that's why it's love, because you've got depth to it, you know? But seriously, I've written it down so I don't forget. People are lonely, isolated, and feel like they don't matter. It's not true. Everybody matters. Like I said before, I'm not special. We're all special now. If you don't believe me, go see your dog. And when you come home and see their face light up, people say, it's just because you feed him. Anybody has a dog knows. No, no, no. It's well deeper than that, right? So I want to um, read a little bit from it for you and, and do a couple more things. And then we, we are going to open to questions. because I don't know about you, but this is going really quickly, far too quickly. Uh, I just want to give a massive shout out because I don't think she's here, but I will do it anyway, to Ruby Golo, right? one of my friends from Ghana. This is a picture of her with the book and a cup of tea and her glasses in Accra, Ghana, reading the book. Guys, write a book because then people read it all around the world and it makes you go, yay, you're helping people, right? And I've got a whole wall. Alan, you're on this wall, right? Full of people 
reading it. But again, hopefully by now you see it's not going to look at Mike, he's written a book. It's like you put something out there with love. That's what matters. You know, everybody here is great grandparents. They're all dead, aren't they? But we're here. Yeah, we're examples of that love living on. It's quite powerful if you think about it. So um, Katie has very kindly agreed to read. Katie, you don't need to read the whole thing because there is a lot there. We had another friend called Erica. She couldn't be here, unfortunately. But she um, is an incredible woman. And she's just written a few things that she wanted to share about the book. So Katie, maybe pick maybe two or three things because I know she's like yeah. a lot of things for you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Michael. And hi, Win. So good to see you, my beautiful Fizz friend. It's, it was so nice to see your face jump in. Um, we're so connected, aren't we? And and I think Erica is wonderful. And she she knows a bit of shorthand apparently because I've got this handwritten note here from her that you've shared with me today, which is just lovely but I don't know shorthand very well. So she's got a couple of words in there. Good on you, Erica. Um, look, a couple of things that stood out reading this was, you know, she's very much a person that looks at leadership through a loving lens and it really encouraged her um, to greatly improve in that space. So it sort of added more depth to that is what I'm reading. And she became more poignantly aware of the impact a leader has and thus such a fundamental responsibility. So that really brought that to life for Erica as well. Um, the one thing down here in Chapter 1 she makes a comment for is, there is no enemy. Focus on the value of people and to people. Be willing to unlearn. And I thought that was that was a really nice comment. And I, I think whenever we go into something new, the unlearning is the biggest task. Unlearning and unravelling those belief systems, our I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy, I'm not willing, um, unraveling and unlearning. So think long-term. Um, she believes that this helps keep us focused on goals, doing what we do. It helps us support and encourage others. And then one last thing, meaning matters. You can help a person to discover purpose and find meaning in their life. How we, how empowering is that concept? Thanks, Thank Michael. You, Thank you. That's brilliant. And everyone has a new favorite word. Yeah. Unlearning. Yeah. It's a, it's a powerful. So as we move towards the end, um, I think it's, it's very important to keep focus on you because it's not about me. Right. If I die tomorrow, I'm actually really chuffed because I wrote what I think in a book. <laughs> that is genuinely as well, a paradoxical thing, trying to live for a long time, but it doesn't happen. Nah. Whatever. Um, I wanted to just give you some, it's not knowledge, but it's insight I've gained in global business that might help you. These are six of the biggest changes and things going on where they're going to need you to step up, right? People tell me all the time. And this is where like the loving and leadership approach can help because it's got the depth to handle these things. First one, no surprise, is AI and fears around it. There's a fantastic guy called Arif Ahmed, A-R-I-F-A-H-M-E-D. He's a fantastic guy from um, Bangladesh. And he's an expert in AI. A lot of people say this. He's 26. He's been in business since he was 12, right? He knows his stuff. And he and I have started a podcast together, but that's beside the point. He knows a lot about AI. And he's helped alleviate a lot of my fears. And a lot of people are concerned around AI. One of the most beautiful things I ever heard was when someone said, what if we treated our technology like a child? Rather than Frankenstein monster, yeah? Rather than being scared of the things we're creating, what if we applied love to it? And I don't mean love in a fuzzy way, as you now know, by growing and developing, embracing the paradoxical nature, nature that AI will actually make us more human than we could without it. You don't believe me? Look at Bob Dylan um, doing plugging an electric guitar as opposed to an acoustic guitar. That's a piece of technology for him to express himself. So AI and fears around it, yeah? You need some depth to handle that, not what's your opinion on it. It's not deep enough. The second one is uncertainty. We've seen in the last few years, uncertainty is not going anywhere. But if you can run with that, and again, you can see how this works. You can apply thinking long-term to it. You could apply, well, what, what does that mean to me, uncertainty? Could I change that meaning to myself? You can literally pick any topic and kind of fit it around that. Third one is cultural shifts. There are massive, massive cultural shifts. And interplays, and, and you know, anybody who knows me knows I've been learning Spanish and connecting with Spanish people and Latin American people. Best thing I did in my life. That's a cultural shift that I'm undergoing. It's the best thing ever. And there's a lot of that going on. Look at us today, together. Incredible. Absolutely amazing, right? So that's shifting. That's not going backwards. Fourth one is a massive one is recruitment and retention. How do you keep the best people? Well, it's really simple. They love working with you and they take a bullet for you, figuratively, right? Not really. But how do we attract the best people? 
it's it, and again I'm, I'm going off on one but it's not about giving them perks it's about taking them seriously and developing them and help them to feel this is the place where you belong how you do that's up to you but recruitment and retention it's not about perks it's about saying we care for you deeply and we're making plans for you to stick around for long term how long long term i don't know three generations do you wouldn't you want a client for 50 years i would if they're a good person uh, last two hybrid working yeah, we're doing it right now. How we work in a hybrid format. That's not going anywhere. Yeah. And the final is education. Eowyn has just said she got a new favorite word, unlearn. In my opinion, that should be part of mainstream education. I learned this from my uncle. Well, you need to unlearn that because it's wrong. <laughs> right? And you need to replace it with this. Education doesn't mean putting things in your head. Educare means drawing out that from within. And that's why I love hearing from you guys. It's like I've given you some stuff, but then it's helped draw and connect with what's already in, in your heart and in your soul, right? So I'm aware of time. Um, but I wanted to read you a little bit from the book because I wrote it. <laughs> and um, I wanted to offer something that really encourages you going forward, yeah? Because don't be scared. We're not done yet. We're just getting started. Don't be scared. Um, and this, I think, sums it up. So, by the way, this guy, when I'm reading out, this is who I'm, I was talking about. Anybody knows who knows who this guy is? Okay. Alan, I can send you a screenshot of that picture. When I've read this, um, if you have any questions, anything you want to uh, know, or anything like I've got plenty of time, I also have to say, merci beaucoup, mon ami Thierry, very kindly put all the links in Amazon, and Andy's just bought a copy. <laughs> that, that is global business, man. Like, Thierry is like, he's in Canada, Andy's in England, they've already bought it. That's amazing. <laughs> so, yeah. So where are you now? How can you begin? It can begin today for you, right now. With your decision to do so, your people will feel safer, more affirmed, confident, capable, valued, and successful. There'll be more laughter and smiles, and less tension and panic. It's never too late to change, to develop and grow yourself, your relationships, and your meaning for both yourself and for others. Your heart and the love that you have for your people can be an infinite resource for you. The greatest source of strength for a loving leader is the love that you have for your people. It's your driving force. I hope that I've demonstrated that by living these six beliefs in your daily life, you can apply this love in practical, process-driven ways for the benefit of all. The world is changing. Business is changing. Relationships and communities are changing. Embrace this change. The one thing that remains true, every one of the 8 billion plus people on the planet is, capital letters, the need to both love and be loved. If this is the starting point and the driving force for your people, and they know this, then you won't go far wrong. So you've read this book through, you can answer self-reflection questions, you can complete, complete the accompanying plan. This will enable you to take what you've learned in this book and make it real in your life. The man who inspired the creation of this framework, as well as Catholos, was Father Peter Robertson. He was a true loving leader. He drew people towards him and he helped them to connect with each other. He brought the best out of people, as well as giving his absolute best for them. He didn't want to be perfect. He was too concerned with helping others. His love for us all was clear to see every day. And the effect he had on so many has lasted for decades and will continue to do so. He was a true loving leader. Now it's your turn. Leaders learn. Leaders love, leaders find a way forward. Love and best wishes to you on your leadership journey. There he is. <laughs> We've got a great set side parting and a fantastic tie. And I'll love him until the day I die. And hopefully I get to see him again sometime. So, you know, if you know anything about me, the whole point of today is to give you a space to, to learn some stuff to reflect, have some time for you. But it's really, really important that you think, okay, but what am I going to do about it? <laughs> if I want to buy the book, that'd be great. 
You might want to help support the book. That'd be great as well. But I'm more interested in you. So have a look at your notes or maybe just take a second. And what, what is something you think? Yeah, I'm going to use the word unlearn. I'm going to connect with that person on LinkedIn. I'm going to, one of those self-reflection questions really bugs me. I haven't got the answer yet. I need to think it through. Well, I've never thought of that before. Well, that insight's really useful for me for my business. I'm going to go share that with somebody. And put it in the chat box if you want to share it. If you don't, keep it private. There is no, there's no need to share it. But just before we open to questions, if anybody has any questions, uh, I want to thank you because as a visionary and as a leader, you spend a lot of the time in your head trying to think of the future, trying to improve the future, hold yourself accountable, like we said at the start. Those moments of satisfaction, those moments where you're like, wow, this really happened. Um, you know, anybody knows me, said so I just recently did a bungee jump. That was one of those moments. Recently did a webinar in Spanish. That was one of those moments. One of those moments where you're like, this is really happening. Oh, wow. This is really happening. This is just an idea in my head. And I realized, hang on, I think I've got a framework I could write down. And to be talking to you now um, is almost quite overwhelming, to be honest. And I want to be very, I want to say very much thank you. If I never get the chance ever again, <laughs> thank you. Because I put my soul into this book. And to look at it now and see it and know that it's helping people. It's not often I'm lost for words, but I am. So, um, Katie, obviously we can open to questions now. You know, thank you. I don't expect to run up. So. No, I just want to say thank you, Michael, because that was really wonderful. And um, we, we do have time for questions and answers because I'm sure, wow, that's a big drink bottle. Keep hydrated, guys. I think that's a really important message there. Now, we do have time to take advantage of having Michael um, and ask any questions um, that you like. You can pop them in the chat bar, as Michael said. Um, some of the things that you were saying today, Michael, I might just kick off, was around the sacred relationships. I think that's really important. And something that was coming up for me while I was listening to you, and it's about stepping forward and being kind and loving and looking at the paradox and reflecting and being self-aware and taking responsibility for a leadership. What are your thoughts when we don't when we see other leaders not taking those steps forward? We see others uh, out in our communities that aren't loving leaders and they probably aren't really embracing that type of nature or in in essence maybe doing the reverse. How how can we respond to that? That's a brilliant question. There are many forms of leadership, servant leadership, situational adaptive leadership, everybody, you could stick a noun, an adjective or a verb in front of the word leadership, you could have pancake leadership, right? So everybody is living a, a version of leadership that's, that's relevant and right to themselves. And like I say, this one kind of makes sense, but it's not that obvious. I don't believe many people go out just trying to destroy other people. Some people do and they're a bit weird, but generally most people are doing the best they can with what they've got. Leaders especially don't like being told what to do. Um, and so often it might be that they've got, you know, a different approach to you. And sometimes as well, this is why it's good to think long term. You have to look at the results that they're getting. So, for example, somebody might use a completely different approach to you, but it might work really well. And then you go, huh, it's not the way I do it. That's even better. So I think being humble is very important because otherwise we go, I've got my method. And I'm going to bash people with it. I think another thing to understand is if you're trying to talk to that person or if you're trying to engage with that person, you have to say to yourself, do I have a relationship with this person? So, for example, if I made a mistake, Katie's a good friend enough of mine to, to call me out on it and tell me and I wouldn't like have a breakdown. you know. But if somebody slagged me off on social media, I might take it a bit more personally. So you have to look again. Relationships are sacred, right? You have to look at and say, do I have enough of a relationship with this person to engage in a critique, a conversation, a way forward? And if the answer is no, this is where it can be challenging. Um, we have to be willing to kind of throw the bridge out a little bit. You know, I'll, I'll tell you something very quickly that I think really might help. It's not about being a doormat. And it's not also about saying, come to me, do it my way. My father's Irish and he taught me an amazing Celtic phrase called Falcha Roja. Don't try and write it down because it's really hard to spell. <laughs> Basically, what it means is this. This is where you're comfortable in your approach to life or whatever. This is where they're comfortable. If you go to them, you're being a doormat, right? And it's strongest wins or whatever. I don't, I don't play that game. But equally, if you expect them to come to you on your terms, that's asking a lot of them. Falcha Roja means 
I put my welcome out before you. Meaning, can we come to a, set, a third space, right? Where I'm can, willing to come out of my comfort zone a little bit. If you're willing to do the same, and that's what's mediation, that's what good mediation is all about, and create that safe third space. That's why the best education, the best critique, we learn together. If they're not willing to do that and they put up the barriers, then fair enough. But, and then again, it's where Brené Brown, people like Brené Brown, really good, they show that little bit of vulnerability. Because sometimes as well, you've got to remember, people don't see the way you see yourself. You know, and you might let that bridge down, but they see you as very standoffish or cold, or they see you as very. So I, I love Foucher Roja because it's like, I'm going to come to you halfway. I'm not going all the way over to you and doing it your way, but I don't expect you to come all the way to me. Either. Let's meet in the middle. And if they're not willing to meet in the middle, you've given them that opportunity. All right. So it comes back to the relationship, quality of the relationship. Maybe they're doing it better than you, and we need to be open to that. We meet them in that shared space in the middle. There's always a way forward. That's what that's what good delegation is. That's what good diplomacy is. You know, in politics, when it works, that's what it's all about. You know? So I hope that answers your question. Actually, really gives me things to think about because there's a real life scenario playing out, and I'm really curious about how I respond to it personally. Like, how do I take it on? Do I take it personally? Do I take action? Is it really my responsibility? And so I'm really in that space of reflection, and that that was helpful. Thank you. I want to open the floor up for others who might have a question. So you feel free to unmute, raise your hand, however you want to get our attention. Um, the floor is yours. Go on, Alan. Alan. Go for it. <laughs> right, so beauty. Right, thanks. Brilliant presentation, Michael. I was enthralled. That that time went very quickly, and that tells me that I was listening to something which was just really sort of capturing my imagination. I'd like to touch on two of your six big changes. I love the fact that you've identified six things to put out there. Very, very brave of you to do that. Um, I'd like to know your thoughts about how the development of AI is going to interface with one of your other big changes, which is recruitment and retention. As I see it, we're, we're going to lose a lot of people doing what they're doing now which when it's replaced by AI. And that in itself will make a big change. So it's managing that almost jobless section of society that's going to be thrown up. There'll be different jobs, I know. But I just find it really fascinating, that interplay between AI and retention. Yeah, Talk so a little bit more about question. that. Yeah. So one of the reasons that I base my, my leadership on love is it's not transactional, right? A transaction doesn't mean anything. It's like, who's cheapest? Who's quickest? And like, say, AI doesn't have feelings. It doesn't care. It's, all, it's, it's a fantastic thing to understand information, etc. But if we go back to the printing press, if we go back to the Luddites when they created the, um, the, the big machines and people used to keep destroying the machines because they're taking our jobs. That's always been going on. And technology come, is always becoming closer and closer to our bodies and we're in contact lenses. So it's why it goes back to the meaning matters and the value that a person has in themselves. So when I used to teach children, especially now adults, to be honest, more than children, if a person feels, I, I do this job and now that job's not available, what am I going to do, right? That is, that's completely transactional. That's treating yourself like somebody who can only do one thing. That's why I suggest connecting with Arif because he helped me to understand. He says things like, um, we don't, I don't want to create jobs for people. I want people to create their own businesses, right? That entrepreneurial spirit, that ability to adapt and, re and respond. Again, if we take that Thomas Merton idea, you're made in the image of what you desire. The technology we create is made in, is made in the image of what we desire as well, be that in a good way, or a negative way, as we know, with biases and stereotypes, who's programming this stuff. And so what one thing that's very interesting is recruitment <laughs> has always been a bit of a minefield anyway. And there's a great opportunity for people that are people-centered using AI as much as you want. People can tell when you're being authentic and they can tell when you can't. And there's a bit of a wild west at the moment where people are kind of saying, is that written by AI? Is that authentic? Is that's why it's good to build these relationships, right? Because it's not either or, it's back to paradox. AI is one of the best things. I read an article the other day about somebody, um, an, a medical center that created a limb using AI. The person could walk for the first time in their life. That is incredible. So I see it as an opportunity for the recruiters or the people in recruitment um, positions, or positions of real privilege, to use these kind of tools and say, yeah, we're all a little bit scared of this at the moment. We're a bit uncertain. But our values, we're planning for the long term here. 
you know? It's like with COVID. Some people treated COVID like this is the way it is from now on. And some people said, well, there's been pandemics before and it makes some changes, but I don't think it's going to wipe us all out. So we, let's play let's play the long term here. So there's a great phrase that said, adversity introduces a person to themselves, <laughs> right? And I think AI is going to do the same thing. Anybody tells you they've got any quick wins and answers in AI, I wouldn't believe them because it's untested. And I don't mean robots going to take over the world. What I mean is anybody's telling you things are going to play out this way. Do you know there's actually studies done in economics by people like Matt Ridley and people that make these predictions and say it's definitely going to be like this. They're 99% of the time wrong. And things usually actually work out a lot better than, than realized. This guy went back and charted the history of economics 200 years and found that the number one thing that improved people's quality of life was free market and ability to trade ideas and money and value. Number one thing that improved the standard of everybody's life. Nothing else beats that. AI can help us with that, right? It's quite a long answer, but I, I do believe it's never transactional and it's never either or. Millionaire T. Harv Eker said, when you've got a choice, ask how can you have both? Right? Happy life, make a lot of money. Why is it either or? And I think this is the thing with people. In uncertainty, some people go on the defensive, some people go on the offensive. Let's go back to Fauci Roa. Why go all the way to that? All the way to that. Maybe there's a middle way. You know, I'm quite critical of people that think they've got it all nailed. I think it's much better for people who have guiding principles that say, I'm going to try it this way. What do you think? Can we collaborate on that? That's how AI came about in the first place. So hopefully, Alan, I've given you some kind of insight into that question. I'm not a recruitment specialist, but I do deal with them. That's great. Appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. We are on the hour, Michael. Um, I wonder if you wanted to take one more question, if there was one more. Is anyone burning to ask Michael a question? You don't have to. <laughs> Can we get a photo there... as well, Katie? Can we get a photo? You know, the cheesy photos where everyone's like, hi. Just yeah, well, if everybody can, do you know how to do a screenshot? No. <laughs> Cesar, <laughs> Cesar, are you on? <laughs> uh, Cesar's a genius, he'll figure it out. Yes, because I haven't mastered yeah. that on this on this laptop. Um, I, can I can take one if you'd like me to. Oh, oh yes, I'd love that. Yeah, and I'd, I'll share it. I could share it on LinkedIn with you. Okay, share it if everybody message. can. Amazing, amazing. I Thanks. think we should hold up our books, Michael. Oh, it's only me and you. <laughs> Alan's, That's okay. got his. Alan's got his. Yes, you led Oh, yeah. It'll... Alan's got his. It'll yeah, take me two... his. Oh, bless her. Yay. It'll take well... me two seconds. Just why I grabbed the screen grab. So it'll take me two seconds. You need to pose okay. for two seconds if that's all right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Yep, got it. Oh, that's lovely. Really Thank really you. Nice. So, yeah, I'll, so I'll, I'll save that and I'll... I put it on. Um, I put it on LinkedIn as a private message to you, Michael, yeah. and then you can oh, you can wonderful. share it with me as well, please, Michael. Oh, of course. Thank you, yeah, Virginia. Yeah, 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 I'd love that. And 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 look, um, Michael, are there any closing remarks from yourself before we? Yes, close? there is. Yes, there is. Anybody who knows me knows I'm a bit of a nerd, so I've got one last quote for you. This drives everything I do. So if you know, put this on my tombstone because it's really long. Find a way. <laughs> It comes from John O'Donoghue, who is a, a Celtic mystic and a poet. And the older I get, the more I realise I have, I have like a culture that comes from my father. So he says, in the kingdom of love, there's no competition. There's no possessiveness, no control. The more love you give away, the more love you will have. Simple as that. Thank you, everybody, for being here. It's been a pleasure. Keep in touch. Thank you very much, Michael. And thank you very much to all who joined us. If you'd like to learn more about the Global Chamber, we're just a note away. So thank you very much for being here and good evening and good day. Thank you. Gracias, Yuka.